My name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College, and very happy to have you here at the virtual reading group. Um, before we jump in to our reading of uh, the Jewish writings um, from the 1950s, uh, a small section, it's, it's, uh, it's only, we're reading the whole section today. Uh, and so we can, we can also think about why it is that um, the 1950s is the, is the decade where Hannah Arendt wrote so little comparatively um, versus the 1940s, 1930s, and 1960s about the Jewish question. Um, but before I jump in, just a, a quick um, note on our schedule and housekeeping. Um, so uh, we're meeting today on the 3rd to talk about the 1950s. On the 19, on the February 10th and 17th, um, we will be uh, discussing um, uh, the letter to Gershom Sholem on the 10th and the Eichmann case on the 17th. Um, I'm I'm hoping I, I got to talk to her if Yana can lead that on the 17th, but we'll we'll figure that out and we'll we'll get we'll get back to you on that. Um, and then on February 24th, according to the schedule, we're starting uh, our discussion of a series of texts on Arendt, race, and racism. And I just want to, um, uh, you know, say I think this is going to be a really exciting uh, series of discussions. Could be difficult, but I, 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 I'm very involved in writing about these texts now, and um, I look forward to the discussions with you. Uh, it's not one book, so it's a little different than we've ever done before in this reading group. And I just want to prepare you for that from a logistics point of view. So the first um, two weeks on February 24th and March 10th, um, we're going to be reading chapters from the origins of totalitarianism. And there may even be some pages in other chapters that I may point you towards. If you have the book, um, that's great. If you don't have the book, you can try and there's PDFs available online, but um, I would I would try and have that book um, for those two weeks. Then we're reading parts of the introduction to politics. And again, that's another book. The book is actually called um, The Promise of Politics, um, uh, edited by Jerome Cohn. Um, and so if you uh, if you can get a copy of that book, um, that would be helpful. If not, there are PDFs available and we can probably pro provide a PDF of the few pages of the core pages uh, that we'll need. Um, the reflections on Little Rock essay, uh, again, can be found either online or in um, the book Responsibility and Judgment. And then on violence is in her book, um, Crises of the Republic, or published on its own. And then the letters to Baldwin, Ellison, and Hutchins will provide or are online. But I just wanted to, to give you a heads up about ordering uh, or or finding the copies of the texts you'll need um, for, for the next, you know, for those discussions. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to write us or, or, um, or let us know in the next week or two if there are questions about that. Okay. Um, but uh, make sure we have that uh, hopefully uh, ready to go and under control. Okay. Um, I don't think Little Rock is in the Crisis of the Republic, Joyce. Um, uh, I believe it's, it's I, there may be a couple other places it is, but it's in the Responsibility and Judgment book. Okay. All right. Um, great. So, uh, as I said, we're today, um, uh, after... 400 pages of so, or 350 pages of reading of Arendt's writing about the Jewish question in the 1940s, there's now about 30 page, 20 or 30 pages in the entire decade of the 1950s. Um, why is that? Uh, well, one answer is the one I think I've mentioned one or two weeks ago, um, which is that, you know, Arendt lost her debates. Um, she lost her debates around the state, around the idea of Zionism and which kind of Zionism would prevail. Um, and 
uh, I think partly uh, as a result of that, she took a step back. Um, a second reason uh, is that uh, in 1950, the origins of totalitarianism came out uh, and it had a huge impact. Uh, and, and Arendt really um, turned herself towards a, a more, um, you know, uh, re- not just talking about the Jewish question. She, she was becoming uh, well-known. She was an American. Uh, and she was giving lectures on totalitarianism uh, and beginning new projects, um, project on, on Marx that she tried to begin. Um, uh, and then, of course, The Human Condition, which came out in 1958. Much more of a, um, uh, you know, I don't know what the right word is, but uh, not focused on the plight of of the Jews. She was, um, you know, more and more engaged in uh, general political thinking uh, in the country and in the world, and um, less involved in in the political debates uh, around Jews and Judaism and and Israel. Um, she did write three uh, three things that the editors uh, decided to, to include here from the 1950s. One is this long uh, longer essay. Uh, called Peace or Armistice in the Near East, uh, then a very short little piece on on, on Uta Magnus, and then um, a, a review of the book um, by Polyakov, um, it's History of the Great Crime uh, about the Holocaust um, uh, that she published. Um, so um, I thought we'd start and spend most of our time on this essay, Peace or Armistice in the Near East, um, which has uh, a lot of really amazing and 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 wonderful uh, insights into it. Uh, many of which I think clearly, you know, are tie into her thinking in the 1950s, both in the origins of a totalitarianism book, which obviously has already been published but also in in the human condition and and other work that she's going to uh, be be coming out with. Um, So she starts uh, with the title uh, or with this opposition between between peace or armistice, right? I mean, um, it's not a it's not a an opposition that at least I hear all the time. um, And yet one that she uh, invests with a certain profundity and one that I think really is meaningful. Um, what's the difference? Well, an armistice is simply like a truce uh, amongst hostile partners, uh, whereas peace requires a kind of a negotiation and compromise, as she'll come to say in, in on page 427, 428, uh, as she gets into that section. Um, there's a real... Uh, um, a real difference, a meaningful difference. Um, and one of those meaningful differences is that an armistice, she says, um, will leave us in a state of having to prepare for permanent hostility. Um, so this is on page 425, where she says in the lower, lo- the bottom paragraph on 425, she says, but the choice between genuine peace and armistice is by no means only, or even primarily, an issue of foreign policy. The internal structure of the Arab states, as well as of the Jewish state, will depend on it. A mere armistice would force the new Israeli state to organize the whole people for permanent potential mobilization. The permanent threat of armed intervention would necessarily influence the direction of all economic and social developments and possibly end in a military dictatorship. The cultural and political sterility of small, thoroughly militarized nations has been sufficiently demonstrated in history. And she goes on to talk about Sparta and other related countries. Um, you know, I, I, you know, the the dangers of that kind of a 
not only foreign policy, but of a domestic policy in a in a, in a in a time in a state uh, that has simply an armistice as opposed to a peace, is that um, you become permanently militarized. Um, uh, you know, and she says possibly end in a military dictatorship, right? Not that it will, but it says that the organize the state for permanent potential mobilization, and 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 I think. We can be we can argue or we can debate whether that's actually true, but there's no doubt that that the state of Israel has had to, in a large extent, make serving in the army and being part of uh, um, uh, the defend the Israel Defense Force, the IDF, um, part of its culture, and there's no doubt that's changed um, or influenced the the culture uh, of Israel, and 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 that's part of what she is is talking about. Um, another main uh, thesis or main theme of, of this essay, and this is one that, again, um, goes beyond any interest per se, any particular interest in the Jewish question, is that between facts uh, and how little facts mean in politics, right? This is something, you know, you've heard me talk a lot about and many people I mean, it, it connects with Arendt's later essays on truth and politics and lying in politics. Um, it certainly connects with what she wrote in um, The Origins of Totalitarianism about ideology. But she's really concerned here to highlight um, the, uh, the ineffective appeal to facts or how ineffective an appeal to facts is in politics or it can be. So just on the first page on 423, she lists a bunch of facts, right? Um, you know, the uprising of 21, the pogrom of 29, the disturbances from 36 to 39, um, et cetera. And it was only logical, she says, that the evacuation of British troops coincided with the outbreak of a Jewish Arab war. And it is remarkable how little the accomplished fact of a state of Israel and Jewish victories over Arab armies ha have influenced Arab politics. All hopes to the contrary notwithstanding, it seems as though the one argument the Arabs are incapable of understanding is force. This is an extraordinary sentence because, you know, I think it's one of those things that you hear a lot that, you know, people... Arabs only understand force. Uh, I'm something I've heard in my, you know, Israeli, up, not Israeli, but Jewish upbringing and times in Israel and American Jewish conversations. And what she's saying is it's not true because the facts are Israel was winning and won over and over again these battles. Um, and they made no difference. Uh, the Arabs didn't listen, didn't, didn't care. And this, she really does expand on in the, in the sections uh, of the book of this essay called The Impat Incompatibility of Claims, beginning on 427, and The Social and Economic Separation, beginning on 430. Um, and, and it's worth just going through these. So on, on 427 is where she says, a good peace is usually the result of negotiation and compromise, not necessarily of a program. Good relationships between Jews and Arabs will depend upon a changed attitude towards each other. And so um, what she goes on to, to argue here is that um, programs, right, peace treaties, peace programs will generally not work, um, just like facts generally don't work, as long as um, both sides uh, basically uh, – are stuck in their own narrative or their claims. I mean, there are many ways to put this, and you know, and this is not going to be revolutionary or radical, but as I keep trying to understand Arendt's thinking about truth and politics and facts and politics and the importance of stories in politics, the way I'm increasingly seeing this in my own thinking and eyes is that in the end, Facts matter very little in politics unless um, in most circumstances. And what matters more 
is which story or which narrative situates and constructs the facts. Um, you know, Arendt is deeply aware of the power of stories and narratives and um, weaving stories and telling stories. Uh, and you know, so much of her work is an attempt to say we need to face reality. We need to um, avoid the kind of um, ideological stories that make us um, uh, discount reality. Uh, and so she's clearly on the side of reality over and against ideology, against um, a kind of narrative, or as she'll sometimes call it, um, a coherent fiction um, that denies reality. And yet she's also deeply aware that facts themselves are powerless and contingent and that we do need to tell stories, stories that give our world coherence. She ends her essay, Truth and Politics, with that brilliant line that truth conceptually understood is one thing, but metaphorically understood it's the ground we stand on and the sky above us. It's the stories that hold us together. Um, and politics, as I understand Arendtian politics more and more, is the attempt to um, tell the stories uh, that hold us together, that are the ground we walk on and the sky above us, but not in a way that we create coherent fictions and impose them through violence and terror, that's ideologies, um, but by telling stories that we woo people to, go back to her ideas on judgment, that we bring people to see as meaningful stories. And we clearly will have different stories in any political world, but we need some stories that we all share, some common world that we all share. And um, and politics really for Arendt becomes um, the sort of contest to woo people to your story um, in that way. Um, the, the next section of this, which relates to this is called social and economic separation. And here she's interested in the fact that for the in 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 Palestine or Israel, um, what we were what what what, the, what we encountered was what she calls the complete incompatibility of claims, the complete incompatibility of claims or of stories. Um, and she says that on the bottom of four thirty, in the in the first paragraph, but at the bottom of that first paragraph, she says, um. The way the Arabs conducted this war has proved better than anything else how little they knew of Jewish strength and the will to fight, right? To the Jews, similarly, the Arabs they met for so many years in every city, village, and rural district with whom they had constant dealings and conflicts have remained phantoms, beings whom they have considered only on the irrelevant levels of folklore and nationalist generalizations or idle idealistic dreams. The Jewish and Arab failure to visualize a close neighbor as a concrete human being has many explanations. And then she goes into them, the economic structure, the social structure, and the idea is that the, 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 the Jews, when they arrived, largely built an economic and social structure separate from the Arabs. And the Arabs were happy to not be included in the Jewish structure, and they kept their stories and their worlds uh, completely separate. Um, and so uh, in that way, um, they uh, both avoided reality. So on page 432, in the middle paragraph, she'll say, it was, however, no accident that Zionist officials allowed this economic trend to take its course, and that none of them ever made, in Judah Magnus's words, Jewish-Arab cooperation the chief objective of major policy. Zionist ideology, which after all is at least 30 years older than the Balfour Declaration, started not from a consideration of the realities in Palestine, but from the problem of Jewish homelessness. The point is 
the the story of Zionism became one of Jewish homelessness. And insofar as it was simply about Jewish homelessness and building a home for Jews, it overlooked the reality of the Arabs. And so she says there was a temptation in the next paragraph to neglect the Arab problem. And if you, I, I think that it's, I think this is an incredibly important uh, insight and one that connects to her telling of the story of the founding of the United States of America as well, where she says that in one of the more, I think, insightful and yet controversial elements of her book on revolution, uh, where she'll say that, you know, what allowed the Americans to um, imagine the country as a land of freedom was the complete invisibility and ignorance of the slaves, right? She says this great, the great crime was simply something they completely ignored in their thinking. They didn't see the slaves. They didn't be, slaves didn't become part of the reality. And similarly, she says the Jews, just the Zionist Jews, um, neglected the Arab problem. Um, and similarly, the Arabs also, as she says, neglected the Jews. Um, and, and, and in both these instances, um, uh, she says there was just a complete incompatibility, uh, non-engagement of reality. They created two separate stories so that these stories didn't become stories that had to intermingle, but became ideological stories that created two separate coherent fictions that were separate from, um, reality. And so on 434, she'll write, the Arab masses awoke only gradually to a spirit of envy and frustrated competition. In their old disease-stricken poverty, they looked upon Jewish achievements and customs as though they were images from a fairy tale, which would soon vanish as miraculously as they appeared and interrupted their lives. So the Arabs simply saw the Jews as a fantasy, a fairy tale. Um, and then she says a little down, further down in that paragraph, with the exception of the Haifa municipality, not a single common institution, not a single common political body had been built on this basis in all those years. The basis of, and what is that basis? That basis is reality. That basis is the Jews with their stories and the Arabs with their stories coming together and being on common councils, being in a common institution and having to build a common world that includes both the stories. So that the stories don't become just ideologies that exclude and include, but become stories that have to be um, uh, built into a common. And she says, no neighborliness could alter the fact that the Jews regarded the Arabs as an interesting example of folk life at best, and as a backward people who do not matter at worst. And that the Arabs considered the whole Jewish venture a strange interlude out of a fairy tale at best, and at worst, an illegal enterprise, which one day would be fair game for looting and robbery. And so um, I take that, I take these, this first like 10 pages of this essay to be um, a really grounded example of RN's thinking about the dangers of ideology and about the challenge of politics in any country, in any country, where there's a plurality of people, which by definition for our end means every country because politics is about plurality. And when there's a plurality of people, there's gonna be in, incompatibility of claims. And the way Arendt thinks about this is that the only way to do politics amidst plurality is to have people in institutions in which they talk to each other so that their stories don't become ideologies, but become things that can mix and find what common grounds they can hold amidst their distinguishing stories. Um, uh, you know, the next section on, on the uniqueness of Israel, how it was not colonial and imperialistic, but something else, um, you know, that it, it, was, it was not born out of exploitation of land, but out of an idea. 
and she really does develop here this idea, this the 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 institution of the Histadruth, the Histadruth, the Palestinian trade unions, which were these trade unions where both Jews and Palestinian and Arabs were involved. And the, these trade unions, she says, were the real things that governed the country. And they dealt with administration. This is on 436. Administration, immigration, defense, education, health, social services, public works, communications, and so forth. And for her, it's these his druth, um, these these trade unions, um, which allowed a kind of common reality to emerge because Jews and Palestinians were talking to each other. Um, and yet it's the loss of these trade unions and the rise of a of nationalist institutions and sovereign institutions um, that she thinks is the great tragedy um, of 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 this period. Uh, the next session on the non-nationalist tradition um, is simply, the, again, to go back to this idea that uh, um, she thinks that the only possible way uh, to create um, a kind of uh, kind of politics that would address the realities of the different incompatible claims uh, amongst Arabs and Jews uh, would be a kind of federation or confederation. And um, uh, these next few sections lead uh, lead her to that conclusion. Um, we've talked a lot about that. I think it's fascinating. We can talk more about it here, but I'll um, just because I'm I've been talking for a long time. I'm just going to skip to the last piece that we read for today: the history of the great crime uh, about this book by Leon Polyakov. Um, uh, you know, as she presents it, and I haven't read the book, uh, it's an excellent book on the Third Reich that's largely based, almost exclusively based on primary material, the documents themselves. Um, and and she thinks that uh, at least four different um, insights uh, are gained uh, by Polyakov's approach. One is simply a chronology of what happened and especially um, what led to um, the mass killings. Um, and that starts on 453 and goes till 455. Um, you know, one of the interesting parts of this is um, Polyakov, through the documents, highlights the four different proposals that were being considered to deal with the Jewish problem um, in Germany. Uh, the first was the Madagascar project, where Jews would be um, shipped to Madagascar. Um, a kind of mix of Nazism and, and Zionism. The second was a mass sterilization project. Um, the third was starvation. And then the fourth was um, extracting maximum work from, from Jews. Uh, and so she sort of is interested in Polyakov's uh, reconstruction of the debates that led to the fifth being actually the one that they chose, which was murder, the gas, the the, the Holocaust and, and the gassing of Jews. Um, the second is uh, this um, concurrence in Nazi ideology that she finds in Polyakov's telling uh, between the eventual mass extermination of Jews and mercy killings and killings of the sick. And she says it's no accident that the first day of the war um, was the day that Hitler uh, had signed the order to have all sick people all um, um, li liquidated, racially unfit sick people liquidated, and that she sees this um, connected to the eventual um, mass killings. The third is the deflation of the myth that people in Germany didn't know what was going on, and didn't pro and that if they and that they and that, and that they um, didn't protest. And she says he clearly shows that both those were wrong. And then the fourth is his discussion of the Judenrechte and how important they were in in helping uh, to uh, allow the Holocaust to happen. All right. Um, I'll stop there. It's been, a, I'm sorry, I talked a little longer than usual. Uh, but um, let's uh, see if, if there's an interest in 
these where people's interests lie and, and where people want to talk about. Um, you can, of course, talk in the chat. Let's remind ourselves to respect each other um, uh, and, 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 and do uh, treat each other with mutual respect. Um, let's have no uh, personal uh, uh, attacks. Um, and, and then you can also raise your hand and, and ask questions uh, here and now by going down to the reactions button and clicking the raise hand button. Um, excellent. I look forward to talking with you and hearing where your interests lie here. Uh, Vigdis, you're up first. Um, are you? Yeah, you... I saw I was muted. <laughs> um, two things. The first is what you said about uh, facts and narratives, which I found very interesting and I think also goes very much to what Aaron thinks. Uh, to me, it also goes along with what she says about experience. And for instance, in, in the preface of Between Past and Future, she says that uh, my assumption is that thought itself arises out of incidents of living experience and must remain bound to them as the only guideposts by which to take its bearings. And the same she says in a, in a conference in 1972, discussing the different academics about her work. And she said, what is the subject of a thought? Experience, nothing else. And if we lose the ground of experience, then we get into all kinds of theories. And isn't that what she is talking about here as well? This is the narratives that ignore the facts. It's the same time. They don't pay attention to what's actually happened. Do you think it's... I think, it's that's, I think that's exactly right. I mean, you know, she talks about experience in a lot of her work. Uh, On Revolution is filled with it. Um, you know, what the Americans learned was the experience of politics, the experience of talking to one another, the experience of governing. Um, it's, I mean, the, she uses experience a ton in On Revolution in exactly the sense um, you're talking about it. It's, it's a politics that emerges from the ground up through talking, through engagement, through, through the experience of having to decide do we want to spend our money on firemen, policemen, or teachers, right? And it's in that, and do we want to, and how do we talk to, you know, people who are pilgrims and Christians and freed blacks and Jews, and how do we all get along and talk to each other? And it's out of that experience of the plurality of the world and talking and coming to agreement that um, she thinks the American constitutional system emerges not out of grand theories um yes it's also the case that some of these people john adams and and um and others were reading Mo uh montesquieu and machiavelli and and others and thus were bringing you know past experiences to bear um but uh but i think you're you're right um you know uh our end is, you know, what is she? She's a political thinker. She's a political philosopher. Uh, she likes to make distinctions. She talks about words. Um, but the groundedness of her thinking um, in the experience of encountering others and experience of talking to others in compromising and negotiation um, is, is really uh, at the heart of how she she understands um, politics, and so um, you know, and it's a and it's a hard thing to th to theorize, right? Um, uh, but that's what, in many ways, I think she's trying to capture in a lot of her politics um, the importance of that experience, and what prevents that experience. What what are the obstacles or blockages? Well, one is ideology, which prevents you from actually engaging. Two is sovereignty, insofar as sovereignty, you know, says one person's in charge and, and we don't need the people to engage in these experiences of, of, of talking and compromising. Um, uh, I'm sure there are others as well, but those two are the two that seem dominant to me in her, in her thinking and work. Yes, and I think we see a lot of this today. <laughs> right. 
absolutely indifferent. I mean, yes, there is so little. I, I remember in one earlier group, I think it was when we read this Kant lectures, I think mm. it was Adolf who said that the, to his experience, there's too little judgment in our time. And I think that is also something, because you, you, you have to think and then to make your judgment and then to, to kind of make them from experience. Mm -hmm. And people don't seem to want to make any judgment. They just seem to want to go along with different masses, choose your people to follow in one way or another. Uh, absolutely. I mean, she writes a lot about, I mean, I wrote an essay, I don't know, like 12, 15 years ago um, about our, 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 our unwillingness to make judgments. Right. And, and she writes a lot about this in, in her work. We have, we have, we've lost our ability and our willingness to make judgments for a whole host of reasons. One is sort of um, relativism and sociology um, uh, but we've also lost, you know, she, what she calls the pathos of difference, the arrogance to make judgments, the belief that it's important to make them and to tell people they're wrong. Um, you know, we, we make prejudicial judgments, but, but it's very hard to judge, you know, uh, within our, within our groups these days. Um, and, uh, we, we, we make excuses more than we make judgments. So I think that's, very much part of her her worry you're right if i could take one other thing that is something you wasn't into though and it's what i find very interesting and it's about what she says about the hebrew university and the collective settlements yeah that i think i've been into this once before and i think when she says she has talked about the kibbutzim where well, i think a couple of times earlier also and she is very sympathetic to them and what she then talks about the it's this genuine contempt for material wealth and exploitation and both yep. your life and the rigorous realization of social justice and loving pride in the fertile soil so and lack of any wish for personal possessions and in this essay she just talks about uh, how uh, this experience holds out hope for solution that may one day become acceptable and applicable for the large mass of men everywhere whose dignity and humanity are today so seriously threatened by the standard of competitive and equitative society. To me, this is a hope I see in other writings of her as well, and which I see sadly so little in our society. In our society, I think this has been, I mean, the level of competitiveness has just spread all over, it seems, and the, the acquisitive kind of society also. So, yeah. but I wish there was a way we could find out how, how on earth are we going to change this to, just to save the earth and, yeah, make people go better along with each other, because there is something very interesting in it, but it's so hard to, to reach out. That's so it. I'm glad, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I mean, um, you know, she brings she the 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 Hebrew University and the collective settlements or the kibbutzim, um, uh, are 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 brought up within the connection of of nationalism, um, uh, and she says, um, you know, at the very beginning of this section, uh, if 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 the big if nationalism were nothing worse than a people's pride and outstanding or unique achievement. Jewish nationalism would have been nourished by two institutions in the Jewish national home, the Hebrew University and the collective settlements or the kibbutzim. Um, namely that both of these, she says, are rooted in permanent non-nationalist trends in the Jewish tradition, um, the universality and predominance of learning and the passion for justice. So she sees um, these two the, the university and the kibbutzim as um as non-nationalist nationalist ideas right um that they both were connected to judaism especially the hebrew university which was a jewish uh university um but were not 
connected to the kind of um, sovereign oriented nationalism in the in the either Hesleyan or Jabotinsky tradition. Um, um, and and so, you know, she finds these um, to be sort of countercurrents to the idea of of sovereign nationalism. Um, and yes, with the with the uh, collective settlements of the kibbutzim, um, you know, it was built on a desire to build a new type of society in which there'd be no exploitation of man by man. And it attracted, she says, the best elements of Eastern European Jewry. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, for, a, for a number of years, these kibbutzim were very powerful and influential uh, part of, of Jewish life in Israel. I mean, they've largely disappeared uh, for a host of reasons. Yes, it seems to me that we have a kind of conflict between two kind of mentalities, one that is want to have cooperation, which Oren talks about a lot here, and the other is to think in us and them. And today it seems like this, this mentality of us and them is very dominant and becoming more dominant. So right. yeah, that's that was just mine. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Um, oh, let me uh, let me move on then. Uh, Piper, you're up next. Um, just a quick note about kibbutzim. Yeah, um, they were also not just to be a social great place to live. It was a way of keeping the kids safe from terrorists. And remember, that happened a lot. And as the military got better in Israel, they didn't need to have so much enforcement. So that's just, and, and that was just one thing. But the reason why I had raised my hand, um, I thought she really hit on a lot of really, having lived there for a few years, I think she hit on a lot of the things that I noticed. There's so much stories that were told before I went there, I was just shocked that people are just living there. There's not all this, you know, we come with all our policies and this one should do that and that one should do this. And, and so she's right in bringing that all up. Everyone is trying to resolve, but the people there aren't resolving. So, and then I just have a question, which she, I, I, having been new to learning about Hannah Arendt, was she for the UN? because that's a way of getting all different kinds of people together, possibly to talk about better ways of living. Um, I don't, I don't know her, her specific views on the UN. I have to admit, I mean, she was skeptical of a world government. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I don't think the UN is a world government. Um, I, I think she was, I mean, I don't know. She quotes, she actually talks about, um, the UN in this, in this essay, uh, insofar as she, there's this man Malik, right. From Lebanon, uh, where is it? Charles Malik, that's on page 440, who is the UN representative to Lebanon and one of the outstanding Palestinian Jews, Dr. Magnus, right. And, um, she talks about how Malik in a speech to the Security Council in 1948, um, uh, called upon the real task of world statemanship, which was to help Jews and Arabs not to be permanently alienated from one another. Um, you know, and she found in that call to the UN, um, uh, you know, a meaningful idea for what kind of statesmanship would look like. Um, but obviously that didn't happen um, and hasn't happened uh, as far as I understand it. So, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know if she, I assume she thought the UN was not a terrible thing, but I'm not sure if she had a great hope in it or not. I don't know if anyone knows if she ever commented on the UN. The UN. Um, but I, that's, 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 that's all I can do with that. I mean, I think in many ways, Aaron could be considered one of the forethinkers of an organization like the UN, 
right? So for a group of friends, um, including um, the, the alternative Zionists that she was a part of um, and uh, people like Hermann Brach, the, the writer, um, all thought about, wrote about, and, and you know, uh, journalistically, but also theoretically about this kind of organization. But I think if you track her response, for instance, to Hermann Brach, who was majorly involved in drafting a kind of like UN proto statement, she was very critical of his kind of universalist ambitions. Uh, so there's already a kind of like hesitation about um, maybe the, the, the sort of um, potential for totalitarian tendencies in a kind of world government idea. Yeah. Yes, that's helpful. And, and as I, you know, I think that's exactly why she was skeptical of the idea of world government, right? I mean, what she says in the few lines she writes about it in Origins is, um, you know, any government can become corrupted. And if you have a world government and it becomes corrupted, that's more dangerous than if it's just one state, because there's always other states to oppose it. So, um, you know, to the extent, I think Jana is absolutely right to the extent that it becomes a universalist ambition. She would be skeptical of it, but I mean, she clearly saw the UN's intervention in the partition of Palestine as a project she was engaged in and didn't oppose, right? She was involved in it. I mean, she wrote about it. She didn't sort of say, get the UN out of here. She thought it had a role to play. So I think that there there has to be some openness and interest to it um, in that kind of capacity. All right, um, great, George. You, you have to unmute, yeah. George? Yeah, yeah. the one thing that she's been consistent on, I think throughout her Career is uh, you know the division between political, the social, and the uh, and the human, and again we're sort of talking about that. Now I'm just wondering, you know, uh, if she were alive, we're doing what ifs. If she were alive now and saw the situation now, what do you think she would say now? I try not to get into what ifs, George. I think you all know that by now. Um. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I, you know, I think, I think there's things that she said back then that we can, that, you know, that we can say have largely proven either right or wrong, right? There's things she got right and there's things she got wrong. If she got right, that, a sovereign national state, whether it was a Jewish state or an Arab state, would be a disaster in this kind of a situation, insofar as the other people would be second class citizens. Uh, she got, um, you know, I think it's, I think she was clearly too optimistic about the potential for this kind of Jewish Arab mutual understanding and co neighbor council you know uh uh government um she got right we haven't talked about this but on page 44 she talks about the emergence of arab refugees um and i think has some very historically right you know approaches like she said you know some of it was based on arab propaganda saying that the Arabs should leave because the Jews would massacre them instead of actual massacres. But the propaganda itself was based on some real things so that there was some, you know, factual foundation for it. And then once they left, the Jews didn't let them back in. Um, you know, uh, and she talks about the tragedy of, of this new category of, of people, the new new category of refugees. Um, and uh, I think she's quite prescient about the danger that would pose to the state of Israel. 
Um, you know, uh, I think, again, I, I don't like to say what Arendt would say today, but I think based on what she's saying, what we uh, the, one of the few things we can say is, you know, a lot of what she said then. You need peace, not armistice. And uh, clearly, to the extent there have been any, there's been no peace in Israel for the last 60 years. There have been a series of more or less successful armistices. And uh, um, that doesn't tell you what you should do now, right? It doesn't. So I don't think, I don't, and I have no idea what she would think we should do now. Uh, but it does tell us that her analysis that we need peace, not armistice, is still accurate and has still not been done. And we could say, well, that's just not possible. And she was an idealist. And, you know, we all have to deal with reality. And 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 maybe that's the case. But but that's where she was then. And I think whether she would change her mind or not now, I, I can't say. Um, uh, but I think if there is a solution, she would say, as she said then, and I think she would probably still say, it's not going to come from the top. It's not going to come from programs. It's not going to come from negotiated solutions at the top. It's going to come from the bottom up, from people talking to each other and uh, councils, labor councils, trade union councils, et cetera. Now, you can still have statesmen, as Charles Malik said, encourage that and promote that. Um, and... But 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 in the end, the solution is going to come from peace, which is always a negotiated peace based on discussions from the bottom up. That's as well as that's not saying I think what she would say today, but it's as much as I'm able to, you know, or willing to to to, to hazard. Yana, do you want to? I mean, I don't know how you would answer that question, or do you want to even try, <laughs> or not? No. <laughs> no. Okay. There you go. Um. I, uh, Alan. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um. <clears throat> I believe that Arendt was in France through the 1950s. Is that correct? No, she was in France until from about 1933. Yana, help me here to 1940, if that's uh, if memory serves. Uh, okay. Well, well, I stand corrected. Um. If you'll allow me. Um. In response to this massacre that took place of uh, uh, Jewish civilians in front of a synagogue a couple of days ago, which had quite an interesting backstory, you know what I'm speaking about. You mean in in in, in the in the West Bank in Israel? Uh, no, in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, but on the okay, yeah, but on the okay. Okay, right. Well, um, on the border, right? On, it's close to Eastern Jerusalem. It was where it was, right or not? Right. Okay. Um, Hussein Abu Bakr Mansur is a Palestinian intellectual who writes for uh, a number of, I don't want to necessarily say Zionists, but a number of uh, uh, Israeli sites uh, or Israeli American sites. This one is Emet, E-M-E-T. Here's an article he published yesterday. If you'll allow me to read a paragraph of it, I think it's very germane. Um, under, uh, underneath such uh, positions lies a conglomerate of presuppositions and assumptions that are rarely openly discussed and mentioned. One such major presupposition is that Palestinian terrorism, the indiscriminate murderous violence targeting mostly directive defenseless Jewish civilians is a core part of the Palestinian identity and a normative Palestinian behavior to be expected. As such, this behavior cannot be blamed on Palestinian society and institutions but on Israeli, Israel and Israeli actions. Um, let me leap forward. This position is not new, but it has become a core intellectual habit of the inter international left since the canonization of the works of Frantz Fanon as a Bible of decolonization. According to Fanon, the murderous rampage of the colonized man against the colonizer is the quintessential act of self-liberation. 
The blaze of wrath and anger that ends in murder is nothing but the birth pains of freedom. In other words, the struggle, no matter how violent or extreme, is the an existential condition and an ontological urgency. These ideas, which started in the circle of the French left in the 1950s to justify Algerian acts of extreme violence against the French colony, became a solid part of the intellectual left taught in the most prestigious academic institutions to generations of leftist activism. Leftist. Okay, Alan I, I, Alan, I get I get his argument. What's your question? Uh, my, my question is, I, uh, lots of good, good thing what my question is, I just wanted to put this out um, as being kind of a ruling uh, analysis on the part of a lot of the anti-Zionist intelligentsia, including Jewish anti-Zionist, anti that um, I think accurately describes uh, what the uh, etiology is of, of Palestinian terrorism and why it's uh, on, on its own terms not curable through negotiation or good faith. Yeah. Okay. No, I think, no, I thank you for that. I think, I don't think that's wrong. Right. But I also think there's another side to it, uh, which is that just as the Palestinian justifications um, don't deal with the reality of Jewish life in Palestine and want to sometimes, you know, push Israel to the sea or 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 not recognize the right of Israelis to be there. Um, I, I think Arendt is reminding us that there's also a, a, a Zionist Israeli story or Jewish story. Um, that has never come to terms with the fact that they were building a homeland in a world in which there were um, Arabs who already lived there. And um, and both sides, to a large extent, have, in her mind, uh, embraced these kind of coherent fictions, which she calls ideologies, uh, that have prohibited them from actually building a common world together. And um, I think it's I think it's not hard to, to to find the ideological unreality in the other side and criticize it. I think what's hard is to understand that it's on both sides and then to move past that and insist that somehow um, we begin talking to each other and finding some common claims and common world. And that's obviously got to be very difficult to do. Um, you know, the last question that I got is what she would say today. I mean, my heart, the hard part of that for me to answer is, would Arendt look at the situation 60 years after and say, let's give up? Look, we're not going to be able to get beyond the ideologies. One side has to win and one side has to lose and let's have a full out war. I mean, that's one answer, right? As, as, as Magnus and her friends always said, if you don't have peace, the alternative is war. And maybe you just have to fight the war. Or would she say, no, we can still engage in this kind of um, conversation and build some sort of a common world out of it. I don't know what she would say. I have no, and I have no right to, to make that claim, to know what she would say, um, you know, because that's a matter of judgment and I don't know what her judgment would be. And I think it's a very difficult call, which one, which side of that to be on. And maybe there's even a third or fourth side that she would see that I wouldn't. So, um, you know, that's my, that's, that's the problem. That's the challenge that I see today. But I think her analysis, right, of peace versus armistice of if you don't have peace, the alternative really in the end is war, helps to see the starkness of the problem. And thus her analysis is helpful today in our own understanding of what we should do, right? That's how, that's how I would encourage you to think about it, not to say what would she say today, or what would Arendt do today, who cares? But she's given us an analysis which allows us to think more clearly and critically about the situation. Gilbert, how are you? 
I am I'm keeping wonderful and you please. I know, Gilbert. Okay. I know your, your internet's not so good over there in in the camps. But um, can you can can you try again? Let me. Okay. Can you hear me now? You're in and out, but but I'm gonna try. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. As uh, as I am very very interested in hearing how Arendt was uh, described the word genuine peace. Because of this, uh, this uh, wonderful statement, could you please share with me where there is a genuine, genuine peace in this world? <laughs> I and, love that uh, question, Gilbert. If if so, please, would you write out of out of a hundred percent? Thank you. Yeah, well, that's a great question. You know, and I don't know if there's any place where there's genuine peace, but you know, Arendt spoke this same language in um in nineteen fifty, I think six when she wrote the epilogue to the second edition of the origins about the Hungarian revolution. And she talked about the, 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 the workers councils and the, and the trade union councils that had done very similar things than what she thought were being done uh, by the, uh, by the uh, trade councils in Israel, the, uh, what, the what are they called? The his, 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 the truth, which is not, not a word I know well, but, which she introduces on page 436. Um, you know, she talks also about the 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 uh the town hall meetings in New England in 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 the American Revolutionary period um as a successful model of this kind of politics. Now, none of these are genuine peace. There were problems with the Hungarian workers' councils, they were largely anti-Semitic. There were problems with the American um uh uh, town hall meetings because they were largely excluding blacks. Um, so, you know, uh, I don't think we're going to, I don't think I can point to you to an example of true negotiated communication and compromise peace. And yet there are models that get closer to it than others. And there are models that get close to it. And then we have to constantly bring more people in. And that's part of the challenge of, of politics is to find institutions that do the kind of, um, uh, that, that, that are engaged in the kind of compromise, negotiation, discussion that builds from the bottom up a, a world. But always these institutions are going to be limited. I mean, even let's say you created one that let in every single person in the United States, it's still limited to the United States. You let in every person in Israel, it's still limited to Israel. There's always going to be exclusions. I mean, this is one of the fundamental paradoxes of citizenship. Citizenship is an exclusionary, inclusionary idea. You exclude others and include people. So, um, you know, who knows how you get to a, a pure one? <laughs> Uh, I don't think it's possible. And yet, um, uh, you know, I think there are models for for this kind of institutions that she's talking about that exist. And I've, I've tried to mention a bunch of them. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think that it's possible to build meaningful institutions, trade councils, workers' councils, town hall councils, local governments, citizen assemblies, things we've talked about that are meaningful examples of negotiation and compromise uh, that don't, and, and, I, and I think that the goal for, I think in a way, your, your question about an absolute peace or a perfect peace or whatever the word we used is, is somewhat of a, a red herring. I, I, it takes us down the wrong path. Don't let perfect be the enemy of the good, right? Let us find good examples of peace. We don't need perfect examples of peace. 
And uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't always try and make the good better. But we also have to recognize that the good is better than the bad. Um, Ken. Okay, let me see if I can collect my thoughts here. Um, well, first, um, what you said about one side winning the war, I can't imagine, I can't see that in this book at all. Like I never, and I don't see that in her other writing either, that the idea of winning sounds a little bit like what you're saying about permanent peace, that it's always winning means uh, contention. It means always different people coming together. It means plurality. It doesn't mean one side winning. I think what she's suggesting <clears throat> is uh, solidarity and you know federation is not is the form of peace. You're, sounds to me more like the form of peace you're talking about than one side winning. Um, and one thing that's coming to mind when you bring up sovereign, sovereignty in uh, uh, past and future where she says that um, for freedom, the first thing we need to give up is sovereignty. And that what she seems to be after is a notion of equality where two sides get together without necessarily even liking each other, but figure out a way to take action and to um, create a more peaceful and durable world together, but not not one side winning necessarily and not and certainly not sovereignty um, so oh go ahead no, no i was going to move on if you had something to say i, did, I had something else yeah, I, look, I i have a lot to say and and it's and 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 i'll preface it by saying again i don't know rn's views on this um i wrote a piece many years ago at this point um, I forget, I think it was called Just Wars. I don't even remember what it was called. So it was, a, it had Just War in the title. And, um, and it was about, an, it was an attempt to make sense of RN's thinking about war a long time ago. I wrote this, I don't even know when. And, and her thinking on war is, is complicated, Ken. And, um, uh, in, in, in On Revolution, in the, in the, whatever it's called, the preface or prologue to On Revolution, where she talks about war quite a bit and distinguishes it from revolution, but also says that, um, uh, you know, in the modern age, uh, we have a problem, which is that we can't really fight wars. Uh, um, we can have police actions, we can have many wars, but war, right, which Clausewitz had reminded us was politics by other means. Um, namely, wars happen when politics break down. Namely, wars happen when in a plurality, there are incompatible interests and politics can't find a way to make them compatible. Uh, well, we live in a world in which war is so destructive and especially with nuclear powers so destructive that not much can justify war anymore, right? Not even really freedom because war will destroy humanity maybe and therefore destroy freedom. Mm -hmm. And so what she says, and again, I, there's no answer to this that I know of, but what she says is we live in this crazy time in which the, the escape valve to the failure of politics for thousands of years for all of human society, which was war, is no longer a working escape valve. It's no longer an option. And so we're now stuck in this position where when politics failed, fails, we have no escape valve. Um, and that's the kind of, that's the way I, you know, again, that's the way I think about a situation like what's in Israel and Palestine and the way she presents it here is we almost have no alternative but to keep trying politics because war is so devastating and so awful. Um, and yet 
without war, it may be that politics is destined to fail. And that leads to the prob- the possibility of a militarized state, totalitarianism, etc. cetera. Um, that's the problem I see, whether she puts it that way or not, that's my reading of her work. She never puts it so clearly, as far as I know. Um, that's the problem I take from her thinking about peace and armistice and war um in these in these kind of texts um and you know maybe war is impossible or maybe it's possible i don't know but without war we're stuck in this sort of hope that politics will eventually work when it seems like it never will and that's the tragedy of the situation as i have come to understand it through her readings um isn't she when you're talking about that finality of war? I mean, clearly there's plenty of wars in our world. Well, so, she we could again you nuclear know, war, right? You know, you, well, I don't even think it's only nuclear war, but you know Arendt is a thinker of distinction, Ken, right? Distinctions. Yeah. So war, you know, means that you seek to achieve your political ends by other means. Um, and you know, the problem is today that. When you are, uh, when you, if you really want to do that, you're going to end up with some sort of total war, which is what you're seeing more and more Russia trying out on Ukraine, where you attack civilians, you attack civilian infrastructure, and you just try and destroy the society and not just the army. And, you know, more and more in the modern world, we don't condone those kind of total wars. And it's, only the rare country that's willing to engage in them these days. Um, and when you're not willing to engage in them, you can't really win the war most of the time today in the technological technological situation we're in. Can I bring up something else? Yeah. Because I see there's no one has their hand up right at the moment. I'm really fascinated by this one clause on 445 actually there's two things on 445 that she mentions one is uncompromising morality and the other is true reality and i true reality is not anything that i remember reading in any of her other books um but seems like it is, has something to do with her ideas of permanence um, where I guess I wanted to talk about where are you at the bottom of four the last paragraph on 445, like the bottom half of it. Um, she's talking about Dr. Magnus. And she says that in a world like ours, however, in which politics in some countries has long since outgrown sporadic influence and entered into a new state of, of criminality, uncompromising morality has suddenly changed its own its old function of merely keeping the world together and has and has become the only medium through which true reality as to as opposed to the distorted and essentially ephemeral factual situations created by crimes can be perceived and planned and true reality sounds is a really interesting term for her to bring up i thought that sounds like the opposite of force which for her is always ephemeral right power seems like it has more durability because power resides within the people force is always sort of temporary this idea of evil as being superficial and then the world being held together by uncompromising morality and true reality i think is kind of an amazing paragraph there yeah i mean I, true reality you know here is 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 reality i mean i don't you know she's she's just it's it's the real as opposed to the ideological it's um it's accepting um you know the the complicated messy truth uh that is reality um uh you know in this case that if if the palestinians left their homelands voluntarily in quotes under the impact of arab propaganda and in panic one may not forget the most potent arguments in this propaganda was the fear of repetition of Irgun Stern atrocities at Dyer Yassin. So, um, you know, it's complicated and it's on both sides. And, 
Um, and reality, true reality re means, you know, not getting caught up in the distortions and, and, and ephemera. Uh, and, but I think the interesting part is what you started with, right? Uncompromising morality has suddenly changed its old function. It's not just about saying what's true, what's re what's moral and not. Um, uh, and has become the only medium through which true reality can be perceived. You know, what, what does she mean? I, I think it's that you have to have a kind of um, almost religious zealotry to be, to be, to stick to the facts and to avoid ideologies um, in order to um, um, hold yourself to reality and not get caught up in these sort of coherent fictions, these stories that, um, that are politically motivated and things of that sort. Um, um, only those who are still, I'll just read the next sentence, only those who are still able to disregard the mountains of dust, which emerge out of and disappear into the nothingness of sterile violence, can be trusted with anything so serious as the permanent interests and political survival of a nation. So, you know, it's those who have the uncompromising morality to avoid all of the, the, the violence, the ideology, the, the stuff that takes us away from reality um, can, can, can really see what's, what's real, what's true. And, and her answer to that is that the people really who can do that for the most part are the people at the ground level, the trade unionists, the the people in the local neighborhood councils, because, you know, they can say, you know, we have to trade with each other, we have to work with each other, and they have to get rid of the the apparatus, the violence, the the dust, and and see each other as human beings. Um and uh and that's that's where that's where her hope comes from that we can actually uh, I, I don't know, Roger. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, I read this differently. I would read this as actually a call for vision and uncompromising uh, morality to me reads as a kind of insistence on the ability to continue to have vision. So for instance, I'm thinking of someone like um, this Italian philosopher, Donatella di Cesare, who argues for a right to, um, to movement, a right for migration. Um, and she tries to, she has this great book, um, uh, uh, which is called A Philosophy of Migration. And in that she tries to move out of the current debate. So in a way out of some of the facts that are constantly thrown around and that people throw at each other, you know, like so many people at the borders, so many resources, et cetera, right? She tries to move out of that and says, we have to insist on a right to migration. And the only way that we can justify that and the only way that we should justify that is um, morally. So in a way it's a, it's a I read this as a, as a kind of um, an, appeal, uh, an appeal to, to, uh, to maintain um, some kind of morality um, for the sake of, of itself in a world where um, politics, she says, has has entered a new stage of criminality. It's uh, it's an interesting mm -hmm. reading, and it you know there. Uh, uh, may I jump in, uh, Professor yeah. Roger? Okay, I would like that is in, at this point is important to remember the distinction that um, Hannah Arendt made between the a connection between a freedom and moral and freedom and uh, politics, because we're used to make a link only between freedom and ethics. And for, for, for she, we have to be, I say, to be clear, to come across this point between the, the, the link, the original link between politics and freedom. And I think this, this distinction has to do with what you are talking about, uh, Professor Roger Hanus. Thanks, Clara. I mean, I think the question Iana is raising, though, is is one that is a good one. Is is uncompromising morality, though, um, 
I think the word Yana used, I, I may have it wrong, is idealism, right? Um, and if so, how does that idealism not become another ideology or fiction that that separates us from from seeing people as humans as 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 real people um and uh and so that's that's sort of the the rock i'm i'm founding myself on right now or teetering on is um i i agree with yana that um there needs to be a certain amount of um of uh morality or uncompromising morality or some resistance to the criminality of the world um but i think there has to that i think that if it becomes simply another ideal um it risks becoming um inhuman um which i think is RN's worry about a lot of ideals like human rights or or other things that they become fantasies um uh and so um that's where i'm sort of trying well, to we had a lecture recently yet it before. become in be, it, it, professor Roger, i i think that also has to be oh, how i would say if if one thinks that freedom has to be only with morally and with your autonomous decisions, you become like forgetting about the society and the world that we are trying to share in common. Then when we talk about politics, we are looking for a freedom that it that doesn't put morally and moral aside, but a, invite to come into into the into the say, into the world another kind of decisions of the search of 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 freedom that's why freedom is so close to meaning because meaning uh, usually sometimes is is put aside or is considered aside morally and now and i think that for Arendt, that search of freedom that is connected with freedom it's it's like a kind of say okay moral is here but politics is here let's look for reality because sometimes in moral you only think in yourself and your decisions and this is not the case in 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 this um, in what Hannah is talking about I think that is important that's my point of view anyway thank you yeah Yana did you want to add something yeah, I mean, I think that um, uh, so reality is also another complicated concept in her work, right? Reality is not the status quo. Reality is, um, I think, it, reality includes an ability to see, to to have a vision. Um, so, and and. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with what Clara is saying about freedom. Uh, and the other thing that I would add to that, we, we recently had a lecture I borrowed on, um, on utopias. And I think that utopias have gotten a bad rep in the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years or so. People think like utopia, oh, that's, that's total, total, totalitarian. That's, that's like fantasy, right? Um, but the lecture was by a, a writer, um, Ilya Koryanov, um, and his point was that stay clear of utopias that flesh out all the details, right? Mm -hmm. The terror is in the details, but it's good to have a utopia that is expansive, that is broad enough to negotiate the details, so to speak, as a kind of roadmap, right? So that's the kind of, um, and I, I wouldn't call that idealism. I, I, would, I would stick to that word vision um, uh, and in terms of this um, idea of uncompromising morality. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I think that's one reason I brought up that paragraph is it sounds like that uncompromising morality is not ideological. It's more like a compass or you said a roadmap. I would say like more like a compass. And for Dr. Magnus, it was based on purely humanitarian grounds. So that's sort of like a direction, but it's not ideological and it doesn't actually say how we need to deal with this particular reality, which is 
what she's wrestling with this entire book. Like, how do we deal with this reality that's not, we, we can't fix? How do we navigate it? But it seems like she does have a compass and that true reality, I think, is closer to not just the the status quo or what the reality is at the moment, but something beyond that reality because it's opposed to the distorted and essentially ephemeral factual situations. So it's something more permanent. And her ideas of permanence are the higher values she was bringing up when she's talking about the Hebrew University, about the kibbutzim, that these are compasses or directions for morality without becoming necessarily like ideological um, or thought processes that blind us to factual situations. Um, and it also seems like there's almost a gravity to that idea of true reality that force is always maintained artificially, um, though the artificial is not negative here when she's talking about it. Force is always maintained and it seems like power is always wanting to take over. Like there's a certain gravity to the whole thing. Uh, now that you've, now that you've, we've settled that, what do we do about that balloon that's uh, floating over us really slowly? <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna leave that for another day. But thanks, George. Um, no, I think that was helpful. Thank you. Uh, it was a good conversation. I mean, I I I think uh, I think the question of of vision and morality is is one important in our end and. Uh, Clearly, you know, the context of this discussion is, um, you know, starting on 444, where she says, the most realistic way to measure the cost of the peoples of the Near East of the events of the past year is not by casualties, economic losses, war, destruction, or military victories, but by the political changes the most outstanding of which has been the creation of a new category of homeless people, the Arab refugees, right? Um, the most realistic way to measure the costs is the political change, namely the rise of the Arab refugee. Um, these not only form a dangerous potential, irredenta, dispersed in all Arab countries, where they could easily become the visible uniting link, much worse, no matter how their exodus came about, whether as a consequence of Arab atrocity propaganda or real atrocities or a mixture of both, their flight from Palestine prepared by Zionist plans of large-scale population transfers during the war and followed by the Israeli refusal to readmit the refugees to their old home, may the old Arab claim against Zionism finally come true. The Jews simply aimed at expelling the Arabs from their home. So, um, you know, there's a couple of aspects of this. One is it's a realistic cost of what happened is that now the Arab ideology that Jews were wanted to expel Arabs from their home has become true. That's a cost. Um, and, and, and to some degree, um, you know, I think part of the importance of Magnus's response, as she says, he's the only one who really responded to this. Only one voice, she says, eventually was raised in protest, the voice of Dr. Magnus, is that his uncompromising morality in, in, in raising this problem um, returns us to um, the real political realities um, um, and thus to true reality. Now, is that an ideal? Is that a vision? Yes, I, I think it is, but it's one based in Arendt's understanding, at least as I understand it, um, connected to political realities. Um, which are not, in her mind, I don't think are are not exclusive of uncompromising morality. Um, 
because that's uncompromising morality is part of our reality. I hope. Um, in an important way. I don't know. I would like to, um, I'm sorry that I interrupt, but the two facts, I think uh, that we forget that uh, the Jews ex accepted the, um, the U UN petition problem. This is one. And the second is, the um, expulsion of all Jews from the Arab countries in 48. Those are all part of the facts. There's a lot of facts that we haven't, you know, addressed here, right? And I mean, if, if we were going to have a course on the Arab-Israeli conflict over the course of a year, I could probably get half the facts out in that year that people would think would be relevant to those situations. But you're right, those are other facts um, yeah. and they're important facts. Um, I know, but if we talk about the fact or the fears of the Arabs um, that Zionism will expel them, then the two facts that I'm adding speak against it. So. Of course, you're right, Talia, but the difference is, is that the, the Jews who were expelled from the Arab states didn't become homeless refugees, right? They were, take, they were taken up into the state of Israel. Now, you can say the fault here was the Arab states that refused to take the Arabs in, the Palestinian Arabs into their states because they, for whatever reason, they didn't want to incorporate them. They wanted to make a point, whatever. Right? There's a whole, like we could get into long i've been through these arguments with people on both sides so many times it makes my head spin there's so many people at fault and so many different narratives and so many different sides right the jews took the the israel took the expelled jews into israel the arab country refused to take the expelled arab palestinians into their countries there's a lot of reasons for that and i don't want to get into that in this yeah. in, we're already three minutes four minutes over our time and as soon as we get into this we're going to be here for another two hours and not even, and not even get close to it. I, I know, but if we want to put aside aside facts, then put aside also the um, from both sides. Well, I so think we have. I mean, she's you know the question is did did the Arab propaganda lead to them leaving or did the Jewish hostility? She says maybe a mixture of both. I mean, I think she's pretty fair about this here. Um, there, there's obviously, uh, in the end, it, the, the Jewish refugees didn't become a problem because they came into Israel. The Arab refugees did become a problem because they weren't let into the, uh, Arab countries. And I think, you know, I mean, for many Jews, that's a fault of the Arab countries. That's the way it's been presented to me by many pro-Zionists. Um, and I think it's a fair, it's one fair argument. Um, mm -hmm. but it's not the only one. And, and, uh, yeah. But but the point is, we don't have a problem with homeless Jewish refugees in this particular instance because Israel took them up. So that's not a, a problem that we have to confront. <laughs> so Israel is just taking taking against Israel that they did take um, the Jews who were expelled. I don't think it's taken against Israel. I don't I I, I don't read this as anti-Israel. I mean, I think she's simply saying this this one particular thing uh, was, an, was an atrocity and was, you know, we suddenly have Arab refugees just like, you know, 20 years earlier or 10 years earlier, we had Jewish refugees. And she says to not address that problem uh, is to leave your uncompromising morality out of the real world. And you have to have, just like the Jews who were refugees needed to be addressed and not ignored, now the Arab refugees have to be addressed and not ignored. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the uncompromising morality that we need to make yeah. part of our real world. That sounds like good final words. <laughs> <laughs>
I think, yeah, I, I'm, we're a little over, so I apologize. This is a complicated issue. I don't want to, I don't want to shut people up on this issue because th these are very complicated and emotional themes. And I do thank you all for addressing them so thoughtfully over the last hour and a half. Uh, and I, I hate to, I hate to have a complicated issue come up at the end and, and have to end it. So I apologize for that. But um, yeah, I, 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 I hope that's helpful. Um, so we'll continue uh, next week with the letter to Gershom Sholem, the exchange between Arendt and Gershom Sholem and, and, and some other people uh, here. And uh, enjoy reading Hannah Arendt. Have a great week. And we'll see you next Friday.